Thanks, Holly. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maureen, and I'm going to be presenting to you today uh, a PowerPoint presentation as well as demonstration in relation to wireless exercise physiology. Uh, just as a side note, we're currently under a severe thunderstorm warning, so if you hear any loud bangs or booms, don't be alarmed, or at least I hope we shouldn't be alarmed. Um, that being said, uh, just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, um, when we say wireless exercise physiology, what I mean by that is how to how to simplify your exercise physiology research and teaching using wireless recording techniques. And so what I'm going to be going through today are a few very common, very typical signals that are recorded from the body for exercise physiology research and teaching. I'm going to talk about the ways that those signals are recorded, why they're important. And then I'll also be doing a live demonstration of equipment you can use. Um, the specific one we'll be talking about today is called the bioradio. Um, but how you can use that to wirelessly record different physiological signals in different environments. And then we'll also have a time for questions and discussion at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So there's going to be a theme throughout this presentation. And what it is, it's, it's the what, why, and how of exercise physiology. So for each different parameter or physiological signal that I bring up, I'm going to be covering the different measures that are important for exercise physiology. Uh, the why, which is why are we even measuring these? Why are they important? And really, what are the endpoints that we can get from this information? And how can we apply it to our research and to our teaching. And then finally, the how is actually a demonstrative portion of how these measures are recorded, the types of sensors that you can use, and how they interface with the body. So the first signal we're going to start with is kind of the standard, uh, the electrocardiography signal, or ECG. And the ECG is measurement of the electrical activity of the heart. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with this. As I said, it's, it's quite standard. And this image here just shows you the standard uh, ECG signal that one might see, comprised of the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. And we'll kind of touch base on those in a minute as to why those different components of the signal are important. Each one of those components, though, is uh, a different portion of electrical activity that's occurring within the heart as blood is pumped through. And we measure this using a few different methods, and the reasons for measuring this are actually really important when it comes to exercise fits. So as a, a quick, you know, general why, um, ECG is a direct correlation to physiological stress that's caused by exercise. So stress is, or excuse me, exercise is one of the most stressful situations in which you can place your body in terms of the physiological response to it. And so as you're exercising, the, um, the, the stress, again, to say the same word, uh, the stress that's incurred within your body is then represented physiologically through a number of different signals, one of them being ECG. And ECG can tell you a lot about what's going on in the body, whether it's during exercise or not. And so that's why it's a, a really important measure for several different reasons. So just you know, starting with the basics, ECG, uh, with that raw ECG signal, uh, which is displayed right down here, you can measure heart rate. And then heart rate creates a, or there's a relationship between heart rate and actual exercise intensity. So again, as most of you I'm sure know, heart rate will increase as the intensity of exercise increases. In addition to just looking at you know, the heart rate, rate or the beat to beat rates, you can also look for both normal changes in and abnormal changes that occur during exercise. And this is really important for maybe detecting whether or not somebody might be experiencing some type of cardiovascular stress or if there's the potential for some type of issue to occur. And let me jump back to the previous slide here. So as I mentioned, this is the standard ECG waveform. And some of the things that you will see within the ECG waveform 
during exercise that are normal changes include a decrease in the RR interval. And so the RR interval is actually the measurement between the peak here of the QRS comp complex, the R component. And so this is exactly what you would expect because as your as you exercise more, your heart rate increases, and so the distance between each one of these peaks here is going to decrease. So that's the decrease in the RR interval. Um, you also might see some minor changes in the amplitude of the P wave here. Um, the height of the R wave could actually increase, and it could also then decrease during maximal exercise. So those are some standard changes um, in the R wave, and, or the R component in the QRS uh, waveform that you can expect to see. Um, a few different things that, that might be visible. Um, the QRS complex itself in total could shorten slightly. There are taller, more peaked T waves, which are these right here. So you'll see the slope of those become uh, a little bit steeper. Might be a, an easy way of explaining that. So those are all aspects of changes that you would expect to see in the ECG signal. However, Conversely, you can also see abnormal changes as well. And as I mentioned, these could be indicative of different types of cardiovascular diseases. Um, maybe the potential for cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, that's something that you hear about with even younger kids, high school, college-aged kids who you know, go into sudden cardiac arrest while they're on the football field while they're playing basketball. An ECG might be something that could indicate that prior to something so catastrophic happening. So you can look at things like abnormal sinus rhythms, and those could be indicative um, of Brady, uh, Brady or, tacha, or tachyarrhythmias. Sorry, that's a good one for me to try to say. Um, it can also show uh, ventricular fibrillations, um, slowed or increased um, components of the ECG signal. So just knowing the normal versus the abnormal components is important as you're going through your exercise physiology, exercise science research. So that was all the why component of ECG, and now I'm going to go into the how. So let me open up here the uh, webcam so I can actually show you. Hi, everybody. Uh, for measuring ECG, we use what are called snap electrode lead wires, and those are these right here. These connect to a surface adhesive electrode, just like this, and then these are placed on the different areas of the body depending on the type of ECG you're measuring. So you could do something which is just a uh, single lead ECG where you're measuring one channel. You could do a three lead ECG that's also quite standard. Um, one of the more common or maybe the highest level of ECG channels to record would be a 12 lead ECG. That's um, partially what's illustrated down here. And so you would use these leads here and configure them appropriately per the number of leads for ECG that you want to record. Um, the electrodes that we actually recommend using these specifically are called high performance electrodes. They're perfect for instances where the subject is going to be going through uh, intense activity, significant amounts of movement or sweating. They're designed specifically to stay on and stay on for long periods of time. So whether they're being worn across the chest, maybe you have some on the legs, they're going to stay on really well and adhere very well for you. However, if maybe you didn't need something so uh, strong or with that long of an adhesion property, we also have a different type of more shorter term kind of uh, standard snap electrode that can be worn as well just for ECG. And there's about 100 different types in between these. Um, but like I said, they're just the, the common snap electrodes that can really be gotten from anywhere. If you've ever recorded uh, surface ECG, you probably use those type of electro or those type of snap electrodes. So then heading back here, um, when it comes to ECG, there's a few things that you're always going to look for, and you're always going to want to measure um, and analyze during data collection. That includes um, the heart rate, like I said, which correlates to exercise intensity. You can look at the heart rhythms and look for abnormalities and normal changes in the rhythms. And then 
as I went into some detail about measuring the differences in the changes in the QRS complex, the QT interval, the RR intervals. All of those are very common things that you're going to be looking for and collecting and analyzing with ECG for an exercise phys type application. Okay, so the next is, uh, signal uh, I'm going to talk about is electromyography, or EMG. So EMG, pretty basic, it's the measurement of the electrical activity of different muscles. And this is another, just like ECG, an incredibly common signal that you're going to measure during any type of exercise or sport application because you want to measure how people are moving. And so every time somebody moves, there's different series of muscle activations. And being able to record those can provide a lot of really good information that can be incredibly pertinent to research, to teaching, to different projects. So some of the things that you can derive from EMG, um, going into the why, are things like um, measuring the the, the, I guess that's the best way of saying it, measuring the order of muscle activation depending on the type of activity a subject might be doing. So maybe you want to look at how an athlete is jumping and you want to be able to detect which muscles are firing at different points in time um, as they're doing this jumping and if they're able to do it different ways and activate different muscles, does that create a higher jump? Uh, you could do the same thing during gait or running. Um, in addition to just detecting the muscle acti activation, you can also look at muscular fatigue. And that's an illustration that I'm showing right down here, where on the left we're looking at a raw EMG signal, and we're looking at amplitude over time. And so within this signal, uh, you can't really see too much, but when you analyze these types of EMG signals, you can start to extract really useful and meaningful information. So what we did here, was actually performed a frequency analysis on the raw EMG signal. And so here is the frequency component over time. And you can see that there's a drop off right here in the frequency of the EMG signal, which means that the muscle fibers are not firing as quickly. And so it's an indicator of fatigue that's occurring. And what I'm going to do is go into a little bit more detail later in the presentation about how to analyze these types of physiological signals as well as collect them. Um, and, you know, maybe going back to the more sport and athletic type application, EMG could be used to optimize training and or exercise regimens. So maybe wanting to make sure that certain muscles are the focal point of, of different activities or of different exercises, EMG would be able to easily tell you that, um, whether certain muscles are being used at different times or not. So then the how for EMG is actually pretty much exactly the same as ECG. We use the snap electrode leads and the surface adhesive electrodes. Two of those electrodes, just like in the image here, would be placed over the muscle from which you want to measure the electrical activity. And you can put them anywhere on the body, lower extremity, upper extremity, torso, doesn't matter. And you can measure muscle activity from wherever you need. And we offer those same different options in terms of electrodes where you can use the high performance, you can use the more standard shorter term um, electrodes which are shown right here. So that's kind of the nice thing about EMG and ECG, you use the exact same type of sensors to record the signal and it's quick, it's easy to set up. So that's why they're two really great measures to always include in your exercise phys research. So the next signal I'm going to talk about is respiration. So Respiration, it's the measurement of inspiration and expiration using, that can be done using many different types of sensors, bands, um, facial masks, all different types of things. But with respiration, the measurement of this, again, it goes hand in hand with EMG and with ECG because it's such an important measure during exercise because it can tell you so many different um, important parameters. It can tell you so many different endpoints at different points in time during exercise and can indicate, it can indicate a lot about performance, about fatigue. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. So like I said, respiration is uh, an, a very important component in exercise physiology. And basically, 
there's a linear relationship that occurs between oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide expiration along with ventilation. So if we're measuring ventilation, you can derive from that oxygen consumption and expiration. And so by being able to measure that and derive that information, there are a lot of different parameters that you can extract from that. Um, just some of them include calculating the respiratory rate. Uh, you can calculate minute ventilation. You can trend over different periods of time. You can look at breath-to-breath -breath respiratory rate. Um, measuring rate at different intervals during exercise at baseline, during, and post-exercise are all important things that can be done during an exercise study. You can look at inspiratory and expiratory time. How long is it taking somebody to completely inhale and completely exhale? Tidal volumes, inspiratory, expiratory volumes are very important, again, in terms of respiratory measurement. And you can also look at instabilities and irregularities. So if there is a dramatic change in the, in the respiratory signal from maybe what's been established as normal, what's the cause of that irregularity or what's the cause of that instability? Maybe it's indicative of a certain type of cardiopulmonary disease, or maybe it's just an indicator of some type of event that's occurring during an exercise. Somebody's becoming fatigued, or maybe somebody became hurt or out of breath. They, you, it can show so many different things, and so that's why respiration is a really great measure to know how to use, know how to record, and know how to analyze. So how do you measure respiration? Like I mentioned, there's a number of different sensors, a lot of different ways that you can do so. Uh, there's nasal oral cannulas that are worn on the face by the nose and the mouth that can measure changes in airflow pressure. Thermistors are usually worn on the face as well, measure airflow through changes in temperature. A spirometer can measure flow rate and volumes. Um, there's pneumotachographs, which are the masks that are worn over the nose and the mouth. Uh, a lot of times you might see those being worn by somebody on a treadmill during some type of stress testing. Uh, the final one listed here are what are called respiratory inductance plethysmography bands, or RIP bands, R-I-P. And RIP bands are what I'm going to be focusing on today when I talk about respiration, because they are a great method for providing so much information with a really comfortable and a really unobtrusive way to get all of that information. So let me um, switch back to the webcam here so I can show you exactly what they look like. So this is a respiratory inductance plethysmography band. And in an exercise application, one would be worn around the chest or the thorax. One would be worn around the abdomen. And each band has an inductive coil that goes entirely through it. You might be able to see it a little bit, but it's kind of a sinusoidal coil. And what this does is measures uh, respiration through changes in the, um, uh, the length, I guess. Sorry, I'm not thinking of the right word. Um, changes in the expansion, changes that occur with expansion and contraction of the chest and the abdomen. So as the subject inhales, the band will stretch. As they exhale, it will return back to normal. And what's nice about the inductive technology is that you're not only going to be able to measure respiratory rate, but so many other things, like I mentioned, that are important to this type of research. So then going back to the presentation, um, the next thing that I'm going to do is actually show you how all of these different signals can be hooked up and measured using one type of device and how you can do so wirelessly. Before I move on though, I don't want anybody to you know, think that, oh, this is all that's important to exercise physiology or that's all Maureen thinks. No. There is so much more that can be measured, and I just maybe don't have the time to go into it. I could probably be talking for three hours, and nobody wants to listen to that. So these are just some common measures, some important measures for exercise phys, but it goes far beyond this as well. And if there are any questions pertaining to that, go ahead and type them into the box, and I'd be happy to address those for you. So then moving on to the actual demonstration part, I'll bring up the camera once again. Um, this is the device that I'm going to be showing you, and this is what we use here to measure different types of physiological signals. So this is the bioradio. It is a completely wireless device, so this is all you have right here. It would be worn by the subject, and on the bioradio are eight 
different channels on which you can record any different type of physiological signal. So this is where you would plug in the different types of sensors that I showed you for measuring ECG, respiration, um, muscle activity, or any other types of signals that you want to record. Those are all connected into here, and the bio radio uses a Bluetooth radio to transmit data to a receiver. You have about 100 to 150 feet transmission range, which is nice because you're taking your subject and you're untethering them from a large amplifier that has to sit on a table, from connecting them to a computer or a wall outlet. Um, being able to take a subject and unhook them essentially and let them move around gives you much more natural data because the subject is able to move around as they would normally not being limited and having to keep in the back of the head oh I probably shouldn't move too dramatically because I might yank something off the table or I might pull off one of the sensors so having a small wireless device is really nice for these types of applications now there's Definitely other types of wireless devices on the market for measuring physiological signals. One of the nice things about the bioradio, though, is that you don't need five different pieces of equipment to measure all of those different signals. Everything that I talked about and then some can all be recorded with the device right here. And so that's what I'm going to go ahead and show you right now, is how we can record those signals in real time. So we offer a software application that's called BioCapture. And using BioCapture is how you would collect your raw physiological data. So this is the interface right here. And the first thing that you would do is go to the device configuration window. And by opening this, you can select the different types of signals that you want to record on each different channel. And you would pick by this drop down box right here. OK, this is where I'm going to be measuring ECG. And then when you're all finished, you would just program your device. I can close that out because I've already got it all set up. And so the next thing that you'll want to do is hook up all of the different sensors to the bioradio per the montage that you're going to be using for your study. So one of the signals I mentioned was respiration. So while I don't have it on, I'm going to hook a respiratory effort belt into channel one of the bioradio. So these are the connectors right here. And we'll just plug them in. So then the next signal I'm going to connect is an ECG signal. And I actually have electrodes placed across my chest, which you can probably see here. So I'm going to plug that into the bio radio as well. And then this connector over here is actually the reference or the ground. And then the last signal that I'm going to hook up is EMG. And so what I will do is actually place two of the surface adhesive electrodes, uh, like I talked about before, over my wrist um, extensor, oh, I'm sorry, wrist flexor muscle right here. So those get placed over the muscle, just like this. Like that. And then I'll take the snap electrode leads, connect those here. And then finally, just plug the other end of the wire into the wire radio. So with those signals, I'm using three of the available channels. I still have five remaining. And so again, this can be configured to any montage that you need for your application. Maybe you need a three-lead ECG. You can easily do that, along with measuring different physiological parameters. So right now, I'm all hooked up. And I'm going to hit Start. And so here you can see the data scrolling across the screen. And I swear to you, every time I plug in an ECG lead, I always invert the leads here, and the signal shows up upside down. So sorry about that. I can't even remember the last time I did it right on the first try. So there we go. Now it's upright. So the first channel that you're looking at is a respiratory channel. And this is the belt that I've hooked up. So you can see as I expand and contract the belt, you get the increase and the decrease in the amplitude of the signal. And so that's what's indicative of the inspiration, the expiration. And from that signal is what we can derive those different parameters, like volumes, uh, rates, times, instabilities, flows, etc. So then the next channel here is the ECG signal. I'm just going to scale this really quick so you can see it a little bit better. Um, I'll slide back. Uh, so this is where you can see the P, the QRS, and the T wave. 
and use this to calculate the heart rate, variabilities, RR intervals, etc. And then the last channel that I have hooked up is the EMG from my arm. So I'll scale this as well so you can see it a little bit better. There we go. So you can see as I relax, the signal amplitude lessens pretty significantly. And then as I contract, you can see the increase in the amplitude. So this interface is what you would use to just collect your raw data. And then we have a few different options that uh, are available for data analysis. And so I'm going to show you one of those right now. I'll go ahead and stop the acquisition here. I'll close me out for a minute and then open up our other software package. So what we have available is an option called VivoSense, and this is a great package to use for quick automated data analysis. It provides pretty much every parameter that I mentioned previously in the presentation, as well as so many more that you can calculate just from raw data. So the first thing that I would do is import a data file that I saved within the BioCapture uh, software. And then over here on the right side, I can select the different signals that I want to view and analyze and calculate different parameters from. So let's bring up the first one here, the ECG signal. So if I double click on ECG, right now we're looking at a 30 second window of raw ECG. And that's all good and great, but there's a lot of extra stuff that we want from that signal. So if we click on the measures, I click on that for heart rate and RR interval. And so what we're looking at here is a beat-to-beat -beat heart rate measurement. We are looking at a beat-to-beat -beat RR interval measurement. And as I mentioned, you would expect to see a decrease in the RR interval measurement as exercise uh, intensity increases because your heart rate is going to speed up. And that's something that you would easily be able to see in this package here. And so essentially you're looking at the inverse here between the heart rate and the RR interval. You would exactly expect that as the heart rate increases, the RR interval decreases. In addition to that, you can trend heart rate and intervals over different time periods. If you just wanted to look at the heart rate, let's say every 10 seconds averaged over that time window instead of every beat. All of that can be easily done. So I'll clear that out. One of the next signals that we can look at here is EMG. So again, what we're looking at is a 30 second window of EMG. And from this, you can do several different calculations. If we double click here, now what we're looking at is the power of the EMG signal. And this is giving you maybe an easier way to look at EMG, where instead of just looking at the raw data here, it's allowing you to compare different points of activation or compare um, different intensities of muscle firing. And so what we're looking at um, here is actually a mean calculation of the EMG signal over two second windows. And so we could change this and, and actually calculate um, a median calculation. We can look at standard deviation, RMS processing. And then by changing this window size right over here on the left, it will average these power calculations over different sizes, depending on what's going to be most appropriate for you for your study. So the next signal that I'll talk about is respiration. And let me just bring up the raw respiratory measure here. Oops, sorry. So if I double click on this, what we're looking at, as I mentioned, for exercise, you want two respiratory bands across the abdomen and the chest. And so top is abdominal, uh, bottom is the rib cage or the thoracic. So as I scroll through, this is where you can see the respiratory waveforms. And um, you know, here's an example um, of a nice sinusoidal waveform. And so what we can do then is from this data, just like we did with the ECG and the other measures, automatically calculate the different parameters that I've already mentioned. So some of the measures, um, for example, let's see, oops, sorry. Here I can double click and right now I'm looking at respiratory rate. Um, and so this is breaths per minute as it changes over the course of the data file. We can also look at, um, here we go, 
by trending the respiration, just like I did with the EMG, what I can do is change the window over which the respiratory measure is being calculated. So you're getting a higher resolution respiratory rate calculation. Uh, we can also look at the inspiratory and expiratory volumes, as I mentioned, um, just by double clicking here. Uh, you're looking at volumes in terms of milliliters, just like you would expect them to see. And the nice thing about the software is all we imported was raw data, but then the end result of the VivoSend software is um, calculated measures. And you can export these to get the actual numerical values if you wanted it in a CSV file, and then have that for, you know, maybe it's a future reference, you wanted to include it in a report, something like that. So to not go on and on about this for the next 20 minutes, which I could easily do, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of the immediate calculations you can do in VivoSense. So now I'm going to jump back to my presentation. Oops, not me yet. There we go. So like I mentioned before going into the demo, there's so many other things that you can measure pertinent to exercise physiology with the bioradio. So you can integrate a force plate for looking at balance and gait. We have core and surface body temperature sensors that you can use. Goniometers that can be integrated to calculate joint angle, looking at flexion and extension of different limbs. Also, accelerometers and gyroscopes for looking at movement and velocities, linear accelerations. You can do all of that. In addition, we have pulse oximeters for looking at blood oxygen saturation. Um, grasp for sensors, so many different things. Ultimately what it comes down to is that the channels on the bioradio are programmable. And because they're programmable and you can change them, you can integrate any type of sensor with our device. So then the last thing that I'll mention is using all of this information but in more of an educational application. So what's really nice about the bioradio well, I guess I've said that there's a lot of really nice things about the bioradio. But another good aspect of it is that you can use this exact same system with a different software package we offer for teaching students all of the things that we just talked about. So going into the LabCorp software that we call it, uh, there are several different individual experiments for teaching students the basics of physiology, advanced uh, signal acquisition and analysis, clinical applications for exercise physiology. And what we do is start from the very beginning because you know, we make the assumption that students aren't going to know a ton about or really maybe anything about physiological signal monitoring. So we start them from the beginning. And once they get through this teaching curriculum, they would then be able to go in and use the BioCapture software, use the VivoSense software, collect their own data, analyze it, use it for student projects, um, graduate projects, whatever it might be. And so the LabCorp software that we offer is a really nice starting point and a building block for students in order to introduce them to this type of science, to this type of research. So then just a uh, couple of references that I wanted to cite there. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention too is that I've done a few other webinars related to EMG, respiration, and those are available on our website, the videos of them. So if you're interested, let me know and I can send you a link directly to those. So then at this point, I just want to open up the floor to any questions. Right, and just a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the box on the screen and I'll compile them. Um, we do have one question, uh, can I sync the bioradio with other devices in my lab? Yes, you can definitely do that. Um, the bioradio can, can measure a lot of different measures, um, but there's always going to be something else that maybe you want to record or you want to integrate. And we offer a few different methods of doing that. One is a software development kit, which would allow you to synchronize data from one device and data from our device together in software. Or you might be able to integrate that hardware component directly with the bioradio into one of the programmable channels. How we have a second question. How much does it cost? So the cost of the bioradio not to be evasive, it depends really on the exact package that you need. So we have different packages for exercise physiology that maybe focus only on EMG and force. We have others that look at 
cardiopulmonary with uh, respiratory measures and ECG. So the final price really depends on your application and how you want to use it. Is it for teaching or for research? So if you, um, I can actually follow up with you right after the webinar and provide you with information specifically so that I can put together a, a nice tailored price book for you. The next question is, how long will high performance electrodes stay on? Um, well, in personal experience, I've left them on accidentally for 14 hours probably, um, not while doing any type of uh, you know vigorous exercise, but moving around and wearing them constantly. And I'll tell you, they stayed on. I do have several customers, though. One of them is actually at an Air Force base who uses the high-performance electrodes for very high-activity ECG recordings. And he said that they're um, at a minimum four to six hours. So that's an actual in-field use application. Looks like those are all the questions we have time for. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much, everybody.